While watching the online lectures, be sure to use the attached packet to take notes on. You'll find the link for the packet here at the title page for each chapter. Click on it, then print out the packet. These gray boxes in the online lectures refer to the slides and pages in the packet. In this online lecture, we're going to talk about other ways to represent an sp3 hybridized carbon in organic chemistry. Up to this point, we've been representing an sp3 carbon like this. And if you analyze this structure, you'll see that the bond angles are 90 degrees. But remember, we learned in a previous online lecture that that is not the true bond angle for an sp3 hybridized carbon. The actual bond angles are 109.5 degrees, which means in organic chemistry, to try to capture that reality, we sometimes represent carbon like this. This representation shows the true 109.5 degree bond angles. But it does it in a kind of notational way, so let's make sure we can understand this notation. First of all, representing carbon this way, you always have a bond like this and a bond like this. We call these the in-plane bonds because simply they're in-plane with the paper or the screen. Then you need to represent one of the bonds like this. We call this the out-of-plane behind bond. The way we need to see that is that this bond is heading outward behind the screen away from us. Whereas this bond right here is also out of plane but heading towards us. So dashed means away and solid means toward. When representing carbon in this format you always have to have these four bonds. But we need to be careful how we place them. For instance what we're saying here is that this is the correct way to represent it whereas this would be the incorrect way to represent it. Notice both these representations have the two in-plane bonds and they have the two out-of-plane bonds. But here's something else I'd like you to know. The two in-plane bonds are always going to be adjacent to each other and the two out-of-plane bonds need to be adjacent to each other as well. Notice that's what's wrong with the structure on the right. We have an out-of-plane bond that is between the two in-plane bonds. So as long as you follow these rules, you can represent this carbon any way you want. In fact, let me show you some examples here. Later on, we're going to be looking at molecules like this. Look at this ring and notice the top carbon that has the methyl on it. That carbon is represented in the correct format. Notice, he has an in-plane bond right here. He's got an in-plane bond right here. And notice he also has the out-of-plane bond going to the back and the out-of-plane bond coming out. And notice both these bonds are adjacent to each other. The same is true for the bottom carbon. The bottom carbon has his in-plane bonds here adjacent to each other and the out-of-plane bonds adjacent to each other. So it satisfies what's necessary to represent carbons using this notation. However, let me show you another example here. Pretty soon, this has to mean something to us. And let me show you how to interpret it. For instance, let's focus on this carbon right here. First, we would have to know that there is a carbon there. It is a bend point in that line. And let's say we wanted to get a better idea of what's going on around that carbon. Well, notice he would have his one in-plane bond here and another in-plane bond right here. But remember, in the bond line formula, an end of a line always represents a carbon. So we would have to interpret this end point of this dashed bond as a carbon being here. And since it's an end point, it would have to be a CH3 group. Now think about it. So far, the carbon has a total of three bonds in front of us. But we know that that carbon would have to have four bonds. So the question is, what does that fourth bond look like and what's attached to it? Well, remember, we know the format of expressing carbons this way. The two in-plane bonds have to be adjacent, which they are. And then remember, the two out-of-plane bonds also have to be adjacent. So we would know to put the out-of-plane bond in this location. And remember, in the bond line formula, we don't express hydrogens. So there would have to be a hydrogen right here. Notice this completes our correct format. The two in-plane bonds are adjacent. The two out-of-plane bonds are adjacent. So that means, given the original structure, we need to be able to think of this right here in front of us. For instance, we might want to react this molecule, and we'd like to know if the methyl is going behind the screen or coming out at us. 
Or we may need to know if the hydrogen is going behind the screen or coming out at us. By quickly analyzing this and using what we know as correct notation, we're able to flesh out those details. Now, this format here is not the only way to express an sp3 hybridized carbon. This is also acceptable as well. Notice this one has these two bonds right here coming out at you, and it has these two bonds right here going away from us. This is just another perspective of an sp3 hybridized carbon. And later on, what we're going to be doing is representing this molecule as just simple crosses like this. And the cross is called a Fischer projection. We'll talk about this projection in more detail in another online lecture. But there's one more perspective we should know just in case. This right here is called the Hayworth projection of a molecule. What's trying to be expressed here is that we have a six-membered ring with two CH3 groups attached, one above the ring and one below the ring. And notice in our ring, one line is thicker than the other. What this is trying to create is the illusion of this bond right here coming out at you like this. Take a few seconds and make sure you see that particular geometry. There are some cases in organic chemistry where we're going to want to know the Hayworth projection in order to get to a particular answer. This skill, like many others in this section, are all going to be very intuitive very soon.